reap what you sow. <coughs> Jeremy Cohen, faith in his proof party. <laughs> I can always count on him. He's going to have these kind of answers. Um, we're going to start in Genesis 16, verse 13. Somebody say amen. 16, just 16, verse 13. <clears throat> just 16, 13, it says, So she, Hagar, called on the name of the Lord who spoke with her, that you are the God who sees me. And she said, For truly I have seen him who looks after me. Father God, you are God who sees us. You see our inner parts. You see our hearts. You see our motives, our desires, our wants, our needs. The things that drive us. And the things that hinder us, Father God. You see this morning the things that are hindering our worship. And the things that are driving our worship. We pray, Father God, that you give us eyes to see as you see and hearts that are willing to change. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's children say, Amen. Amen. Today we're talking about El Roa. Actually, I looked up pronunciation for this and it's El Roi. El Roi. But that sounds weird to me. El Roi. <laughs> El Roi. The God who sees. And then there's another version, <clears throat> Jehovah Roha, or Jehovah Rohi. Jehovah Roha, or Jehovah Rohi, is my Lord who sees, or Jehovah Ra, the good shepherd, the Lord, our shepherd. <clears throat> but right now we're going to focus on this, the God who sees, Jehovah Rohi. And I think it was just a few weeks ago Grant preached on this part where Hagar was the maidservant of Sarah and Abraham. And the Lord had promised to Abraham that his descendants would be like the stars. And that he would make a great nation out of Abraham. And Abraham and Sarah were getting up in years. And they started to think that the Lord was lax in his promise. And so Sarah gave Abram Hagar her maidservant. says that Abram went into Hagar, and together they conceived, and she became pregnant. And the Bible says that as soon as Hagar saw that she had conceived with a child, that she had contentment for Sarah, her mistress. And Sarah, seeing that Hagar had contentment for her and mistreated her, went and complained to Abram. And she said, the servant that I had given you now sees me in contempt and mistreats me. And so yesterday I was talking with um, Jeremy. <clears throat> and I said, you know, one thing that the, I felt like the Lord had showed me is that a lot of times those who are most generous to you, you take advantage of or take for granted the most. And I put it this way. <clears throat> Randy does the laundry in the house. He does the laundry all the time. I don't really wash my own clothes most of the time. Most of the time, Randy washes my clothes. If I go to my drawer, it's like it's a magic drawer. Magical clean clothes that are folded appear in my dresser. It's like, wow. I got married. I moved into this house. Now there are always clean clothes in my drawer. Well, what happens is Randy also is running a daycare at the church, and she runs our household. And sometimes I go to my drawer, and there's nothing. I do nothing in this process. But if I go to my dresser and I open my drawer and there's no clean clothes in there, what happens? Wait, there's no clean clothes. What's going on here? Go 
Lord Brady, what are you on strike? I don't have no clean clothes. Is it her responsibility to wash my clothes? I'm fully capable of doing the laundry. But I have become accustomed to her doing this for me so much that I take it for granted. I'm going to go to my dresser and there's clean clothes there. I take for granted that this is the way things are going to be. And so when the generosity stops, then I get upset like I deserve that. And I forget she's doing that as a courtesy to me and not something I'm owed. And so those people who are the most generous with us, we take for granted the most. But me, having limited wisdom, sometimes the Lord intervenes and says, hey, you shut your mouth for a minute. It's a lot easier, it's a lot easier for you if you go along with your wife and not take it for granted. The same thing with our dog. I don't like dealing with the dog. Brandy deals with the dog. And the one time nobody deals with the dog, I get upset. If it's picking up after it, feeding it, I'm like, oh, nobody fed the dog. And then I end up just like another dog. I told Jeremy last night, sometimes I'll like Marky. He's our golden, uh, golden retriever. Sometimes I like him. And then I have to deal with him, and then I don't like him so much. But it's, let me tell you this. It's better to dislike the dog than to fight with the dog. <laughs> That's with me. This is the case here with Abram. Sarah comes in and she says, Hagar, the maidservant, which I had given you, has conceived, and now she mistreats me. And Abram, thinking he's wise, happy wife, happy life, says, she's your maidservant. Do with her as you will. Treat her as you will. So then the Bible says that Sarah went back to Hagar and treated her harshly. That's all it says. Treated her harshly. To the point that Hagar fled from her presence and ran away into the wilderness. How bad do you have to treat someone for them to flee from your presence? I mean, it's gotten rough. You talk about toxic relationships. Toxic relationships get so bad, you have to flee from their presence. I think it may have gotten out. I think it may have gotten out. I believe Hagar feared for her life. Or at least thought, I cannot live like this any longer. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's somebody sitting here right now, and you're in a situation, whether it be at work, whether it's at home, whether it's in some relationship, and you're starting to think, I cannot do this any longer. Anybody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, real quiet today. I feel like nobody's, I feel like nobody's into it. Everybody's still asleep. We'll just preach longer. We'll make sure we get this through. <laughs> and start threatening from the pulpit. We'll be here all day if I don't get some amens in this place. <laughs> amen? Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Maybe you're in that situation like, I cannot deal with this any longer. Or you can think of a point in your life where you are in a situation at work or in a relationship where you're like, this is not a safe place. I cannot live like this. Hagar had reached that point. She could not live like this any longer. And the Bible says she fled from the presence of her mistress, Sarah, into the wilderness and came to a spring. She's in the wilderness. And there at the spring, it says that the Lord, the angel of the Lord met her in that place. The angel of the Lord came and he met her in that place. And he said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael. Because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over and against all his kin. That is a wild and powerful prophecy. For some to say, I'm trying to imagine if Brady was pregnant and the angel of the Lord came and she pro he prophesied over her Isaiah. He will be a wild donkey of a man. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> That's the proper answer. <laughs> and she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her and said, You are a God who sees me. For she said, Truly, I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, she called the well Beer 
Rahai Rohi. They lodged between Kadesh and Bedlam. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called his name, the name of, I'm sorry, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael. This is sticky scripture. A lot of these passages can get sticky, especially in the context of our culture today. Because you have Ishmael, who's the maidservant of Sarai. Sarai is the wife of Abram, maybe the most powerful man in the region. Definitely leader of a nation already. Many livestock, many servants, a very powerful person. And he uses his influence over his servant, and they conceive together and bear a son. This is a touchy situation. Touchy at best. You have to understand that the culture was far different at the time. Doesn't make it right. And it appears that after this, even though this was wrong, and the treatment of Hagar was wrong, that even though that all this happens, it seems like if you read the scriptures, that God blessed Abram. Why is it? And that seems wrong. What's the word we're looking for here? Equity? No. There's no equity here. There's not equity for Hagar. Obviously, she's not on the level of Sarah and Abraham. Is it equity? Is it fairness? Is it fair? Are all things fair in this situation? Man, what's the word we're looking for? What's the word we're seeking so much in our culture today? What do we want most of all? Justice. 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 We want justice. We want justice to be served. We want justice to be done on Abram. For treating Hagar wrong. We want justice to be done on Sarah for pushing her, her maidservant out. She created a toxic and hostile living and work environment. Hagar now is pregnant and forced to go out into the wilderness. Abram had sexual relations with this lady and got her pregnant. Where's his responsibility? Where is God in all this? Have you ever read a scripture and thought, that doesn't seem right? That doesn't seem right. And how many times have you heard people ask you questions about how certain things can be allowed in scripture? How can it be allowed in scripture that the man of God takes advantage of a relationship with the servant, has a son, and that son not be the child promised? Or be put out? So if you know the rest of the story, Grant talked about it. God fulfilled his promise to Abraham. He called him Abraham and gave him a son, Isaac, which means laughter. He fulfilled the promise in Isaac. What happened to Ishmael and Hagar after that? Anybody know? They did become grace. But they were also driven out. They were driven out. Right? And we're paying for it today. All the way today, the nation, Ishmael's descendants are warlike, wild, fighting against everyone, and everyone's hands are against them. Prophecy fulfilled. And it seems unfair, but you have to think about it this way God was never for that. He did not approve of it, He didn't sanction it, He didn't approve of Abram and Sarah's decision to do it, and there were consequences. And though it looks like Abr Abram was still blessed in spite of that, we got to know as Grant preached about it, there's a reason this keeps coming up and it needs to be reiterated over and over again that God made the covenant with Abraham. And remember when Grant said they divided the animals in half and put half on this side and half on this side and when people made the covenant, they made them walk together through it. And Grant said if they break the covenant, then what they were saying is, let it be done to me as was done to these animals if I do not fulfill this covenant. 
So God said the terms of the covenant to Abram. I will make your name great. I will give you a great nation. He gave all Abraham. And to Abraham, he's going, this sounds great. I'll start this deal. And as they were getting ready to walk through together, God calls a deep sleep upon Abraham. This is where it gets tough for us. Because God walked alone through the midst of those animals. God walked alone and made the covenant with Abraham. God has a responsibility to himself that he said to be faithful to the covenant. And it's hard for us to understand that when we're not faithful, that God is still faithful. Yeah. And though we fall short, he always comes through. He always sets the standard and lives by it. He is righteous and just and true. And so because he set the terms of the covenant, he alone was responsible for the outcome. And Abraham was free. That doesn't mean that there aren't consequences to our sin. That there aren't consequences to us when we don't follow after the covenant. When we don't live up to our side. But every time we fall short, God is still faithful. This is the amazing thing about it. I was talking to Jeremy about this, and I'm still working through this church, and I haven't gotten to where I'm ready to preach yet, but I want you to imagine that Christ in flesh, in our flesh and bone, being human, 100% man, just like we are, with flesh and blood and feelings and desires of his own, died on the cross, was resurrected on the third day bodily, in flesh, there is a human being that entered into glory and is seated at the right hand of the Father right now. That when God looks to his right, he sees humanity in the flesh. That God reaches out and touches his son. He touches us. I haven't got there yet, right? I haven't fully thought this out. But to even think about it boggles my mind. This is the faithfulness of God in pointing out that Man, Abraham was, was deeply flawed. Sarah was deeply flawed. Hagar was deeply flawed. There was not one of those three who did right. There was not one of those three that if you did justice on, that they would still live. Still live. I love that song. The God who knows the hearts of men until he lets us live. Justice is that God has withheld his hand and his mercy. Something else we were talking about this week is that the Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth. And what I heard a man uh, define meekness as was having a sword. Was having a sword, but having the wisdom to sheathe it. Having a sword, but having the wisdom to sheathe it. Matter of fact, what he said, he said, it's Jordan Peterson. He said, be a monster. He said, be a monster. Be aggressive. Have ambitions and desires and pursue them. Be competitive. Be a monster, but learn how to control it. Here is the God of all the universe, Jesus Christ, who with the word of his mouth could lay waste to entire Roman soldiers, armies, squadrons, legions. With the word of his mouth, he could strike Caesar dead on his throne. Herod could fall in a moment. And still when they came to him in the garden, and he said, I am, and they all fell down, he let them take him to the cross. This is what meekness is, having the power to be able to have victory and dominate, but having the control to allow himself to be led like a lamb to slaughter to the cross. This is why when Jesus says, no one takes my life and I give it up, you get a better understanding. You get a better understanding. God who sees the hearts of men and still he lets us live. If justice were to be done on us, if justice were to be done on us, we'd all be dead, men and women. But this is what we're at as a culture. 
There's something wrong in the world. Man, Errol Smith said it right. Something wrong with the world today. I don't know what it is. Nobody knows that? <laughs> we live it on the edge. I'm so hard. There's something wrong with the world. There's something wrong. We all know there's something wrong. And we're doing our best. We're fighting. We're striving. We're fighting against one another. We're getting on social media. We're typing out long paragraphs of how they're right and I'm wrong and you're wrong and I'm right. Over and over again, we're having these conversations where news outlets, instead of reporting the news, are doing editorials on what's right and what's wrong. And they're going to let you know how to live your life, how to treat other people. This is what happens when no one will stand to the standards of God, but we try to make our own way to set the world right. We want to set the world right because we know something's wrong. It's obvious. See, there's something wrong. You can read this scripture and say, there's something wrong with that. That wasn't right. Hagar was treated unfairly. Do you know who else was treated unfairly? Sarah. You know, I've read this scripture a thousand times until maybe this year. I didn't really put it together. Could you imagine being Sarah and being buried? And God has promised Abraham a seed. What a, what a terrible place to be in as a, as a woman. So then you give her, you give your man Hagar, because you want, you want the best for Immediately they conceive. Now who do you feel is at fault? Can you imagine the self-condemnation she was under? How terrible she felt? You gotta understand, it wasn't an understanding woman empowering culture we lived in. Man, how terrible Sarah must have felt. And then as a man who loves his wife, I gotta think about Abraham. And he was caught in tight spots. Maybe one person in this room really knows what it's like to be caught between the will of God and the will of yourself. And we won't go too far today. Can you imagine? God is telling you this is what's going to happen. And your spouse is in the condition she's in. And it's a bad place to be in. And you're known as a man saying, all a bad spot. And we all want to set the world right. I think we all really want things to be right. We do want things to be right. People who don't know Jesus, I think they still want things to be right. I think the world is like that. And I think you can tell because you go on to social media or you turn on the news and there's all these SJWs, social justice warriors. There's the woke people. There is cancel culture people. There's reformists. There's the Me Too movement. There's Black Lives Matter. There's all these groups who want to set the world right. We want justice. We want justice to be done. We want judgment for wrongs. We want judgment for crimes. We want the law to be upheld. We want fairness and equity and impartiality. We need justice. We wonder why we can't get it. And maybe you're looking at the news and you're seeing the trial for Derek Chauvin and you're thinking about George Floyd. There's probably people in this room who have two different opinions. Do you want justice done because of what happened to George Floyd? Or do you want justice done you think Derek Chauvin got the raw deal? Are you like me and you see two men whose lives have been laid to waste? And you say, God, we need you. God, we need you. God, we need you so much right now. If there's anything that can set the world aright, it can only be done by the blood of Jesus. That fruit of the vine that we spoke about here in Jesus. What the world needs is the blood of Jesus. They need it more than ever. And we've got it. We've got that flame that you can share over and over again and never run out on and never run dry on. The more you share it, the more it grows. It doesn't deplete. And we have it. That's the message we've got to get out there. That's the justice that needs served. 
Do you want to know the truth about justice? Justice was done. Justice was done on him who had no sin at all. They brought him forth, a lamb to be led to slaughter, made him carry his cross, ripped his beard out of his face, beat him and punched him, put a crown of thorns on his head, Tony, made blood run down into his eyes. He had already sweat droplets of blood. blood. He was in anguish. He cried out to his father, Ray, if there's any way, let this cup pass for me. He had no sin of his own. They let him carry his cross up the hill of Calvary. He couldn't carry it alone, so they had Simon come and help him carry it. And when they set him up there, they laid him down on the cross. They drove the nails into his hands and into his feet. They lifted the cross up. They let it drop down in the hole. And he hung on the cross for six hours and, and suffocated slowly, rubbing his back on the rugged cross where they had whipped him and laid him open. And he was bleeding out. He stuck a spear in his side. And he died on that cross. Let justice be done on him. That was the justice God had in mind. That by his stripes we were healed. Let justice be done on him. Let me tell you something else. That's the only justice God will accept. I don't care how well founded the organization, organization is. I don't care how righteous their claim is. I don't care how much justice and how much right and how much goodwill they have. The only justice that God is going to accept is the justice he done on his son on the cross and no other. I don't care how bright it is. I don't care how well spoken. Praise God, there's one justice to be had in this world. And it was done 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem on Mount Calvary. It's the only justice. It's the only justice I'm looking for. Because if I know if I look for another, it's going to go bad for me. If I look for another, it's going to go bad for me. I know me. Justice for Hagar. Hmm. It doesn't seem right. But there's another point to this. That if you want justice to be done a different way, then you have to be able to tell God what's right. That if you think your idea of fairness and your idea for equity and your idea of impartiality is more right than his, then you have to be able to look him in the eye and tell God what's right. And the only thing I can do when I get in the presence of the Lord is tell him how much I'm wrong. Right. It's like it comes out of me. I just can't I can't do anything but blurt it out. Every time I'm in the presence of God, I just want to confess every sin I've got. I want to lay it out there every time. I'm afraid if I don't, then I'm going to die. You ever been in that place? You ever been in the place where the presence of God is so thick, you just start confessing things? Don't you? How am I ever going to stop and tell him he's right and I can't stop talking about how wrong I am when I'm in his presence? I feel like Isaiah. Woe unto me, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and a people of unclean lips. I can imagine prostrate out in the presence of God, blabbering about every sin he's ever committed, and God going, yeah. You know, he sends the angel down, he can't get a word in, because Isaiah can't stop confessing his sin, he touches the coal against his lips. Maybe he didn't shut up. Praise God. I don't want any justice. That's not God. Deuteronomy 32, 4. This is a beautiful scripture. We need to write a song like this. Mike. Write this verse there. He is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are justice. All his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Just and upright is he. Why? Why did he bless Abraham? Why did he bless Abraham? Hagar said that he was the God that sees her. I want you to know that he sees you. He sees you today. And right now you're probably thinking of him. If not right now, you can think of a time in your life where you felt like God did not see the situation you were in. God is not seeing what you're going through. Do you feel like God is not watching you? God is not looking your way. 
What a blessing it must have been to Hagar when she's out in the wilderness. And the angel of the Lord appears to her and says, You will conce conceive a son and call him Ishmael. It was a rough prophecy. This is not what you want to hear about your baby boy. But she was just so glad that God saw her. She didn't really, fine. You see me. You see me. The one who looks after me. I've seen the one who looks after me. He sees me. She was just so relieved that God sees her. She didn't care about nothing else. God sees me. Sometimes it's enough to know that when you're going through it, that God has not abandoned you, that he's there, that he sees you. And then you're like, I'll go through this because my God sees me. The one who looks after me sees me. The one who looks after me sees me. Not only that, he most likely shepherded you to that place. He shepherded you to the valley of the shadow of death. And you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. You're wondering, does God even see me? Not only does he see you, he led you to this place. He's going to walk you right through it. He's going to lead you out of it again so he can walk you beside still waters. He can lay you down in green pastures. He can anoint your head with oil. He can let your cup overflow. But before all that happens, sometimes you've got to go through the valley of the shadow of death. And the Lord who sees you, not only sees you, but leads you through it and goes with you. He is Jehovah, Ra, the Lord our shepherd. I like this version of Psalm 23, 1. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What I like better is another version that says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I lack nothing. If I'm going to go through trials and temptations, if I'm going to go through those evil and dark days in my life, everyone knows that moment when life, you're just walking through, like Tony said, sleepwalking through life. And then a minute, a phone call comes or something happens. And in an instant, life becomes real and it hits you in the face. And you wonder, are you going to walk through this? Is this going to be the death of you? Last night, the kids were riding side by side. And Esco came in and said, Michaela ran over Peyton. Immediately, as a parent, you think the worst. We're both running outside, thinking Peyton's going to be laying in the field, side by side, still parked on her. <laughs> what happened was the tire brushed her leg. <laughs> <laughs> Young people, listen to me. You have to pray for her. She's healed. <laughs> <laughs> Young people, listen to me. We think the important things happen over a long period. I want you to know that sometimes the most important things happen in 19 minutes. They happen in two minutes. You make a decision like this, and it affects your entire life. We talked about Jordan Floyd and Derek Chauvin. Both of men made decisions that affected them their entire lives. That quick. It went down in 19 seconds. my job, Graham's job, these leaders in the church job, all those who call themselves teachers, it's our jobs to train you that in the incident that happens, faith awakens in you, and you make decisions based on who God is, and not who you are. So in those instances, that 19 minutes don't change your life for the worse, but change your life to where you walk and trust and obey in Christ. These small decisions that we make, there's grace that covers them. There's definitely grace, the grace of God. He's so good. And praise God, he, praise God he didn't hit Abram with lightning when Abram made this decision. But our job is to train you that in these moments that you react in faith and not in the flesh, because in faith, in faith, we believe that God sees us. He sees our situation. He's shepherding us. We trust him in it. And in the flesh, we feel like we've got to do what's just and right for us. And so many times when I thought I was doing right, I was sinning against God. Don't seek your own justice. I'm telling myself this all the time. 
Sometimes I feel like I got to stand up and fight for what's mine. And that scripture that God started me on with, I keep in my pocket today. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's right hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And trust in his justice. Trust in the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Let's pray. Praise you, O Lord, the God who sees, the God who sees me. Search my heart now, God. Find in me any unclean thing. And remove it and make me more like you. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen.